Come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come to Him with thanksgiving. I will praise you, Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of all the marvelous things you have done. I will be filled with joy because of you and will sing praises to your name, O Most High. Let us enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. We'll come into his presence with singing and know that the Lord, he is God. Let us make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever. He is worthy to be praised. Come, Come let, let us, us worship, worship together. together.
Good morning, Glenn Kirk, and good morning to all of you on the patio and uh, at home as well. Would you stand wherever you are? Let's join together in singing praise to the Lord this morning. Place to hide this weary soul. This vagabond. And I try with all my might, but I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting, a vagabond. Just when I ran out on the road, I met a man. told me that I was not alone. You picked me up and turned me around and placed my feet on solid ground. I thank the Master, I thank the Savior, because you heal my heart, change my name, forever free. I'm not the same. I thank the Master, I thank the Savior, I thank Cannot deny what I've seen. Got no choice but to believe. My doubts are burning like ashes in the wind. So, so long to my old friend. Burden and bitterness, you can just keep it moving. Oh, you ain't welcome here. Oh, from now till I turn the streets of gold, I sing of how you saved my soul. This wayward son has found his way back home. You pick me up and turn me around, place my feet on solid ground. I thank the master, I thank the savior, because you heal my heart. Another one, I am free, I am free, I am free. Hell lost another one, I am free, I am free, I am free. Oh, hell lost another one, I am free, I am free, I am free. Hell lost another one. In all 
And I know you will do it again For your promise is yes and amen You will do great things God, you do great things And break every chain, oh God, you have done great things. And we dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great things. Hallelujah. Sing that again. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah, God. Above it all. Hallelujah, God. Unshakable. Hallelujah. You have done great things. You've done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. He has done great things in our lives. At this time, two things. One, kids dismissed to Sunday school. God bless you as you go. Everybody up through fifth grade. Everybody else, before you take a seat, turn to some people around you and just say good morning, hello. Then you can find your seat. guys. My name is Heather. It's nice to be with you today, whether you're here in person or out on the patio or watching online. Um, we're just so glad you're with us. And I don't know, I, I just feel really pumped after that music. That was really good. So um, I hope you are too. <laughs> um, so we are glad you're here and we want to know that you're here. So please, um, if you're here in person, fill out the connection card on your bulletin, drop it. Um, in the box by the door on your way out. Um, if you are worshiping with us online, make sure you log onto our app or um, onto our website. Go ahead and fill out the connection card there. Also, make sure you're putting your prayer requests on there because we do absolutely want to be keeping you and your needs in prayer. Um, speaking of bulletins and the website, please make sure you're checking those out. We have so much going on right now in the life of our church. Um, Glenn Kirk is diligently... Um, at work as a community, and um, we really want you to get involved, whether you're participating in ministries, volunteering. Um, all of that information can be found in your bulletin on the website. And if you're not following all of our different social media pages, please do that too. A choir um, is kicking off their year with dinner and a rehearsal on Wednesday, September 14th at 6 p.m. And you can RSVP to Brooke Smith. And guess where her information is? The bulletin. Um, so please do that. And also mark your calendars for our healing prayer service, which is September 18th. Um, this is a time to come before God and make your requests known for spiritual, emotional, and relational healing. And um, we will also be live streaming this service if you can't make it in person. 
our next Belong class starts um, September 26th. And this is uh, where we have an opportunity to come learn what our church is all about. Uh, Pastor Tim will lead us um, as we explore the vision and values of Glenkirk um, and where you have the opportunity to discover how you can become a fully devoted follower of Christ, build relationships, and serve God within the church body. And um, finally here, you may have noticed in your bulletin when you came in this morning, there's a thank you card. Please hold on to that. You will receive instructions later in the service. If you are um, worshiping through giving this morning, um, please take this opportunity to go ahead and um, log on to our app or our website. Um, there's a text to give phone number you can give there. You can give on the Glenkirk app um, or go to glenkirkchurch.org forward slash give. Also, you can drop it in the boxes, or on, excuse me, the box um, in the lobby. Now, would you, uh, would you join me in prayer? Oh God, we are just so thankful for how you are at work, how you are at work in our church, but God, also how you are at work in our lives, Father. God, you are so big, and yet um, there is nothing too small for you, God. And so we give all the big things to you and all the small things to you, knowing that you love us, that you can do great and mighty things, even in the most shameful parts of our lives, God, you can redeem it all. Father, there have been times this week where we have really messed up, where we have lost patience with loved ones, where we have betrayed somebody, where we have hurt someone, God. Please be in those relationships, Father. God, reconcile us to you and reconcile us to each other, God. Father, as many families are starting, restarting routines or starting new routines, going back into school, God, we pray for those families. We pray for the transition. We pray for the kids that this would be a fruitful time of learning, God, and growth. God, and help keep families connected as they're often running in so many directions, God. Help to um, remain at the center. Father, and uh, as we go through this week, help us keep our eyes open for those around us, what other people's needs are, God. Help us to show compassion, to show love, to show grace, even when it may not seem natural to do so, Father. Help us to be your light, your hands and your feet in our communities. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. have been held in your hand from the moment that I wake up until I lay in my head I will see of the goodness of God all my life all my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am made I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice I love your voice Cause you have led me through the fire darkest night you are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend and I have been in the goodness of God all my life you have been faithful Every breath that I am able, I will see 
Father truly love us. He does. And does the Spirit move among us? He does. And does Jesus our Messiah hold forever those He loves? He does. And does our heart attempt to dwell again with us? Conquer the grave. He is David's food and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. And every people and tribe, every nation and tongue, He is made us the kingdom, the priest of God to reign with the Son. Is He worthy?
this morning. Uh, I was uh, struck by a story last week that I came across. It was actually a, thank you, it's actually an older story from a few years back about um, A.J. Jacobs, the author of A Year of Living Biblically, as he went on this journey to thank everyone involved in making his morning cup of coffee. So he started by thanking the barista who served him his coffee and the man at the coffee shop who chose where to source the beans from. Taking this journey one step further, he, he thanked the truck driver who delivered the coffee to the local shop, as well as the people who paved the road that he took to get to the coffee shop. And taking it yet another step further, he thanked the people who invented the coffee cup and lid that they used, uh, the woman who did the pest control at the warehouse where the coffee was stored, and the people who work at the New York Reservoir who ensured that there was water for his coffee to be made with. He ended up going all the way to Columbia to thank the people who had grown uh, the coffee that he used in his morning cup. He called this journey, Thanks a Thousand, because by the end of it, he had thanked over a thousand people for their part in, in making his morning cup of coffee. When asked why he went on this journey, AJ spoke about the negativity that he had been struggling with. He said that he had had this grumpiness and anxiety that negativity seemed to be breeding within him. And he found throughout this journey that gratitude and thankfulness helped him push back against that. He would say that in the beginning of the journey, as he would wake up in the morning, he would wake up in his normal state of grumpiness and negativity, and then he would force himself to write a thank you note or pick up the phone and call someone and thank them, and it would change his whole outlook on his day. And by the end of the journey, he no longer woke up in a negativity, and he was in this wonderful habit of saying thank you. Gratitude, he said, transformed his life. Gratitude transformed his life. So I went down a little rabbit trail and found that there is some research that backs up what A.J. Jacobs had claimed. According to Harvard Health Publishing, negativity can make worse the health problems we already suffer from. It can give us more aches and more pains and more unhappiness, but being thankful, gratitude, it's one key to living a happier life. People who regularly express that they are thankful report being more energetic, happier, more spiritual, more humble, more forgiving than those who do not. So while negativity can breed within us more negativity and more anxiety and make things worse, positivity, which includes thankfulness, thankfulness pushes back against all of that and helps us. In other words, gratitude can change your life. And this reminded me of a story from the Gospel of Luke. It's a story about saying thank you. It's a story about how much gratitude can indeed change your life. So if you're able this morning, I invite you to stand for the reading of the word from Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through 19. Hear the word of the Lord. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, 10 men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, go show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them came back. When he saw he was healed, he came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked We're not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, 
Rise and go. Your faith has made you well. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So Jesus is traveling from Galilee down to Judea, the area where Jerusalem is. And he's traveling with this group of disciples, which the Gospel of Luke reminds us is more than just the 12. There's also a group of women who who help fund Jesus' ministry and travel with him. And some of them have been healed of, of evil spirits and diseases. And sometimes there's a larger or smaller crowd that also travels with him, made up of men and women and probably children who are just eager to hear his teachings. So as he's traveling with all this group of disciples, no matter uh, how big or small it had been at that time, he's going along the border between Samaria and Galilee, and he's approached by 10 men who are suffering from a contagious skin disease that the Bible refers to as leprosy. The story says that the men came to Jesus while he was still outside the town. So he hadn't yet gone in to the town and And this reminds us just how isolating this disease of leprosy was in the time of Jesus. That those suffering from it were often removed from their homes, their families, and their communities. And they often all lived together outside of normal society so as not to spread their contagious disease. What often made this worse was that leprosy was considered a religious defilement, making someone ritually unclean. So it essentially excommunicates you from your religious community. The story also says that they shout to Jesus from afar, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. So they know that they're supposed to keep their distance. They know that they're supposed to be cautious. So Jesus responds to their plea and tells them to go and show themselves to the priest. Seems like kind of a weird response when you don't know the context. Uh, But the removal of leprosy was actually regarded as an important religious matter. You had to go and be seen and inspected by the priest in order to be considered ritually clean again. So Jesus instructs them to go to the priests, and as they're on their way, they're cleansed. So this story brings up a lot of questions for me. So I read it, and I think, first of all, how far on their journey were they? As, until they realized that they were healed. Like, had they taken a few steps and then they realized it? Or had they gone a mile or two? And, and what did it look like when they realized they were healed? Was it that they were walking and their pain suddenly left them and they, they took off their bandages and saw that their skin was cleansed? I keep wondering, had any of these men lost fingers or limbs to this disease? And if so, did they grow back? You know, like what, what did this look like? The Gospel of Luke doesn't give us a lot of these details. But it does give us one important detail. It says that only one of the ten who were healed came back to thank Jesus. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Only one came back. It's kind of hard to comprehend, right? I mean, if you're imagining it, you're you're there, and you've, you've contracted this contagious disease that has taken your whole life away. You are no longer allowed to live with your family and your community. You're no longer allowed to worship in the synagogue. And then a traveling rabbi comes by and heals you, And it doesn't occur to you to go back and say thank you. I mean, it's kind of hard to wrap your head around. And and this wasn't just like one person who didn't remember. Nine out of ten of them didn't go back. Growing up, my dad always had a few sayings that he would cycle through with us kids in various situations. One of those was, well, there's two kinds of people in this world, those who are thankful and those who aren't. And he would usually say this when he was really impressed by someone, when someone like went out of their way to show that they were really grateful for something that had happened. And he wanted to point out this behavior to us so we could imitate it. So he'd say, hey, kiddos, it, there's two kinds of people in this world, those who are thankful and those who aren't. And we understood that as a, as a 
something that we should be emulating, that thankfulness was something our dad really valued. But my dad would also say this when one of us kids wasn't being very grateful and someone did something for us like opening a door or, or picking, something we had, picking something up that we had dropped. And if we didn't say thank you, he'd say, well, there's two kinds of people in this world. My dad was asking us what kind of person we wanted to be. Did you want to be one who was thankful or not? So when I read the story about the 10 who were healed and the one who comes back to say thank you, I can kind of hear my dad's voice in my head. You know what, Buggo? There are two kinds of people in this world. There are two kinds of people in this world. That one was a grateful person. Yeah, the story brings to mind so many questions. But the main one that comes to my mind when I read this story really has to do with Jesus' response to the one who comes back, the one who was thankful. Jesus asked, we're not all ten cleansed. Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. So in verse 14, we saw that Jesus has already cleansed all 10 people. They are healed on their way to go to the priest. So what does Jesus mean here when he says that this man's faith has made him well? Wasn't he already made well? I think there is more going on here. And when you dive in, you see that that's true. There's more going on here than simple physical healing. So the Greek word used earlier in the story to describe the cleansing of all ten is katharizo, which can mean to make clean, to purify, to physically heal. It's the normal Greek word used in the New Testament to describe when people are cleansed from something that had made them ritually unclean. It's the word you would expect to see in the story about someone who's healed from leprosy. So all ten are cleansed in this way. All ten are katharizo. Then by being physically healed, they are given the chance to be seen by the priest and be completely brought back into society. But the Greek word used in Jesus' last statement, to the one who was grateful, is a different word. This is sozo. And while it can also mean to cause someone to be well after being sick, it has other meanings, like to be delivered, to be rescued, to experience divine salvation. It's the same thing that Jesus says to the woman in Luke 7, a few chapters earlier, when she interrupts the dinner party and washes his feet with her tears and wipes them with her hair. He says to her, your faith has saved you. Sozo. All ten men were katharizo, but only one was sozo. All ten were physically healed, but only one was delivered, rescued, experienced divine salvation. His thankfulness, his deep sense of overwhelming gratitude shifted something within him, and something else miraculous happened. His show of gratitude to Jesus revealed his quality of faith. Your faith has made you well, has saved you. Gratitude transformed his life. Because there's a connection here in this story between gratitude and faith. Research may indeed show us that gratitude has the power to transform our lives by making us happier or more energetic or more forgiving. And I think that's wonderful. <laughs> but I think this scripture also shows us that something more is going on here. That gratitude shows, that it shows us that gratitude plays this role in the lives of our faith that, that goes beyond just what's on the surface. And that makes sense to me. Because to be grateful, to be thankful, that's to acknowledge that there's something good in your life and that the source of that goodness came from outside of you. It's to notice that the things in our lives that are good, at least in part, have to do with other people or with God. 
And I think that thankfulness helps us connect to that something larger, something outside of ourselves, partly because it's kind of like a magnet that draws us, like this man, to the feet of Jesus, the source of being restored, the source of transformation. This one man was healed and was so grateful for this good gift of health that he recognized it came outside of himself. He recognized Jesus was the source of that good thing. And so he was drawn back to the feet of Jesus where he could be transformed. And in a world where physical health isn't lasting, that is. Because the point of worshiping Jesus isn't our own prosperity, right? We don't worship God because we think that God is a vending machine who will give us anything and everything that we ask for. We recognize that we live in a broken world and that we won't experience the fullness of God's kingdom until Jesus comes back. But we know that God loves and cares for us. This story shows that God even cares for our physical lives But we believe that there is something more lasting in this world than physical health, and that is the life transformed by Jesus. So there is this connection between gratitude and faith. Luke 17 shows us that gratitude can change your life in a way that outlasts the physical. Billy Graham once said, a spirit of thankfulness is one of the most distinctive marks of a Christian whose heart is attuned to the Lord. A spirit of thankfulness is one of the most distinctive marks of a Christian whose heart is attuned to the Lord. In other words, if we're Christians whose hearts are attuned to the Lord, then our lives will be marked by thankfulness. People will know us because we say those words. We show that in how we live. The one who came back, the one man was grateful. His heart was attuned to the Lord. He was healed, and his healing led to wholeness because he didn't lose sight of the one who'd done the healing. This was a day to celebrate, right? For all 10 men, they had been restored. This was probably a day of of reconciling and meeting their family and friends again and going back to the synagogue again. But for the one man, that would all have to wait because he wasn't focused just on his healing but on the source of that healing. He was drawn back to Jesus and fell at his feet. There are two kinds of people in this world. What kind of person are you? What kind of people are we? If someone wrote our story down and someone else read it 2,000 years from now, what camp would they put us in? Would we be considered a thankful people, a grateful people? Although it seems shocking as I read this story to see that nine out of 10 people didn't come back to thank Jesus. It seems easy to judge it when I'm reading it in the story, but if I'm honest, I feel a little twinge of guilt when I read it as well. Because of all the questions that this story causes me to ask, The final one is, what kind of person am I? (laughs) Am I like the one? Or am I like the nine? Am I the kind of person who is grateful? Am I the kind of person who, who can't see outside of myself? Am I the kind of person who can't sense when something good is happening for me from an outside source, from other people or from God? If I'm honest, Some days I look more like the nine. Some days, no matter what it is that I'm dealing with, and whether really good or or really difficult, I, I struggle to look outside of the things that I am carrying. I struggle to recognize the good things in my life and to thank the people and the one who is responsible for that. And sometimes, sometimes I'm better than that. Sometimes I'm more like the one. Sometimes I can turn my back on on pride or selfishness or even just the burdens that we carry. Sometimes I'm able to recognize the good things in my life and where they come from. And the words of thankfulness are on my lips. 
There are two types of people in this world. Am I like the one or the nine? So I'm finding that it takes practice to be a grateful person. I'm finding that gratitude is kind of like a muscle that can seem really weak in the beginning, and as you work it out more and more, then it becomes easier. I'm finding that the more I see what others do for me, the more that thank you is on my lips, the more I focus on what God has given me rather than what I feel I'm lacking, the more I do all of those things, then the easier it becomes to keep doing them. The more my mind shifts towards Jesus and others, and it just becomes easier. I'm finding the truth of that story about A.J. Jacobs in his journey of thanks a thousand, that gratitude can change your life. Gratitude can change your life. But I'm learning that it is because gratitude draws us back to the feet of Jesus, who is the source of that transformed life. So I invite you to join me in something this week. When you came in, you were given a bulletin, and inside that bulletin there was a thank you card. If you have that with you, would you just pull it out? You can take a look at it. Thank you to Jen, who ensured that we all had these today. If you didn't get one this morning, if you didn't see it in your bulletin, there are more in the baskets in the lobby, so please grab one on your way out. But I just want you to take that out and look at it. Um, because this week I want you to take that home and pray about it and ask God if there's someone, like to bring someone to your mind who you could say a special thank you to this week. Someone who's done something good for you or for someone that you love that you want to reach out and just show your gratitude. There are lots of ways to practice gratitude and that could be keeping a gratitude journal, writing down the things that you're thankful for every day, or saying those things to someone else. You could begin prayers. This is one habit I've tried to get into, is begin your prayer time with saying thank you for things, rather than asking for things. Or I think this is a great way. When I was trying to think of some way we could do this all together this week, I thought, why don't we all try writing a thank you note? So I invite you to join me in writing one this week. I'm gonna be doing that too. Um, and we'll practice that practice of gratitude this week together. There are two types of people in this world, those who are thankful and those who aren't. May we be a people who are thankful. May we be a people who, like A.J. Jacobs, go out of our way to thank those who bring the small joys to our life, like a cup of coffee. May we be like the one who was drawn back by gratitude to the feet of Jesus. And may we be a people who experience and know the power of gratitude to transform our lives. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Loving and everlasting God, thank you for bringing us together this morning. Thank you for what you have done for us, freeing us from the powers of sin and death. Thank you for the transformational power that your Holy Spirit brings in our lives. We love you, and it is in your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing this last closing song together. For the beauty of the earth, for the glory of the skies, for the love which from our birth over and around the skies, Lord of all to Wow.
for the joy of ear and eye. For the joy of ear and eye. For the joy of For the mystic harmony. Seeking sense to sound and sight. Lord of all, to Thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. For Thy church, for Thy church that evermore lifteth holy hands above, offering upon every shore. Sacrifice of love, Lord of all, to Thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. For Thy selfless gift, divine. Next week, Pastor Tim is going to be kicking off our September sermon series, which is Glen Kirk on Mission, where we'll dive into the four parts of our uh, mission statement, which, remember, I'm new. I have them right here. Worship, invite, become, and love. If you're newer to Glen Kirk, we hope this series will give you a clear glimpse of who we are and that you would feel welcome to come and be a part of this. And finally, if you're here and would like prayer today, uh, we will have some of our elders up here on your left, uh, just before the platform. They would love to pray with you. So now before we go our separate ways, hear this benediction. May the power of gratitude pull you to the feet of Jesus this week. And there, may you experience the presence of the God who loves you. And may you be transformed. Amen. Go in peace.